guys ever been thirsty? Some like, yes, like right now, actually. Some of you guys are like thirsty. It's like early in the morning. It's daylight saving time. It's like you're thirsty for that extra cup of coffee right now. How many of you guys are just like, the struggle is real? <sighs> like I barely made it to church. Listen, but you guys, listen, you made it to church, which is awesome. So can we give it up for everybody? You guys are at the early service too, which means you're spiritual. You're more spiritual than the other services. Man, I tell you what, I... Man, there have been times in my life where I just feel so thirsty, I feel like it, I could die. You know, one of those times for me especially is every time I wake up at 3 a.m. And I just turn into this whale shark, you know. I just like, I like want to guzzle up as much water as I can. I think I have a video of me at 3 a.m. Uh, just the other day. <laughs> that, yeah, that's me. I know. I know, 3 a.m. looks really weird on me. But, uh, man, have you guys ever woken up like that? You're just like, man, I'm so thirsty. I just need to, like, consume all of this water around me. Like, I remember I played football in high school. And um, I know you look at me and think athlete. Of course, I played football. And I remember during two days in the summer when it was, like, 100 degrees outside. And you, and you would you know, be doing practices. And you have two days. And you're just, like, like, you're in the middle of practices and drills. And you're just like, I cannot wait for that water break. And so we would break for water and then we would sprint over to the, to, to the water trough. I don't know what you call it. We're not pigs. But the water area, we actually came, they came up with this new thing. Instead of just water bottles, it was just like a, a little stick that you press water into your mouth. It was weird, but it was awesome because we loved it because it was so refreshing. Man, I, I remember uh, just this last year, I went on a hike with some friends here from church, and I, I'm not really a hiking kind of guy. Like, I've never actually, like, purposely, like, went on a hike. Um, again, I know, shocking for a lot of you. Um, and I, I remember we went up there, and, we, and a couple days before the hike happened, my friend told me, they're just like, hey, Rob, it's actually a 10-mile hike. And I'm like, hold on, 10 miles? on purpose, like no one's chasing us, what's going on? So I decided, I tried to like backtrack and get off this, you know, hiking trip, but my wife really likes hiking, so I'm like, this is a good thing for me to do. So, um, you know, we went, we went hiking, and I, I remember we, we got there, and it's not just like, it's like five miles in and five miles back, so there's, you can't really quit in the middle of this, you know, like if you quit, you start living there, that's what happens with this hike, and so we get there, we get about like six or like maybe like four miles in, and I'm just like, I'm done. I'm over it, guys. I'm hot. I'm sweaty. You know, and like, and we see people coming back, and I'm like, hey, hey, are, are we good? Do we kind of get the gist of what's going on? I'm not trying to live up there. Like, are we, are we fine? They're like, no, you're almost there. I'm like, listen, that's not the question I asked. Are we, like, I don't, this is, like, we see it, right? Like, there's nothing we're, like, missing. And I, I remember we, we get there, and it ended up being great, you know, and then we, on the way back, you know, I started to, you know, our water started to get warm. Have you guys ever been on a hike where your water gets really warm? And then, like, you get so thirsty that you just chuggle, the, like, chuggle? You, get, you chug the, the warm water. And uh, then you're out, you're out there, and you're just like, man, I'm, I remember thinking, I am going to die. I am so thirsty. I've never been this thirsty in all of my life. And I felt sick. And I remember, man, as soon as we got into the, into the car, we ran over to a gas station and I just chugged some Gatorade and some water. Man, I was, I was desperate. I was, I was so thirsty. But do you know that there's actually another definition of thirsty out there? Some of the young people are like, he's not gonna say it, is he? <laughs> Listen, there's, there's another definition of thirsty. There's a difference between being thirsty and being thirsty. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Listen, listen. For those of you who don't know, there, I'll tell you the Urban Dictionary term for thirsty. Thirsty means too eager to get something or desperate. So you can look at someone over there and be like, oh my gosh, they must be so thirsty. You look over there and be like, she thirsty <laughs> over there. You could be too eager, too desperate. You know, if like a guy's too desperate, like he's like always like a little too available, you know, like he's all, like he's sending those long big text messages and the dot, and the bot, the, the dot bubbles are always popping up. Like he's always replying like within seconds of this thing. Like he's like, people be like, he kind of thirsty, he kind of thirsty. Or like maybe, like maybe you see this when you see someone post something on, on Instagram and they try to like get a little too much attention or they try a little bit too hard and people call this a thirst trap. Look to your neighbor and say, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Come on, you can say, look to your neighbor and say, are you thirsty? 
Listen, the reality is that our souls are in desperate need for satisfaction. Our souls are desperately thirsty. And we all look in different places and we all look at different ways to quench this, this thirst of our souls. We go to different wells to try to see if we can get what we're looking for. You know, I have, some, I have some props up with me today. And for those of you who grew up in church, this is a communion cup. For those of you who did not, this is a shot glass. And <laughs> You know, we, we think... We think, man, we, we have this kind of longing in our souls to like satisfy this inner, inner desire of thirst in our lives. And we're like, man, if I, I think, if I, think if, I can, if I can perform well, if I can do good, I can actually fill up my life. I can actually, I, if, I, if I get good grades, I can kind of, I can fill up my life and I can maybe at one point get to the point where I can get to the top. Or maybe if I get good grades in school or get into that school or kind of get into that honor society or something, maybe that, that's when that's when I'll be good. Or maybe you're like me and you're like, man, once I just like finish school, oh my gosh, when I finish school, that's when I'm going to be happy. That's when I'm going to be satisfied. Man, I'm, I tell you what, like the longing in my soul is like going to be fulfilled once I finish school. But then you realize when you, when you get there that you're like, wow, this isn't really what I thought it would be. You know, I just kind of finished and now I'm kind of in the same, same spot. Or maybe you move on to success and you're just like, man, if I can just get that job, like if I can just, if I can achieve this level of success, I won't need anything. If I can just get that money, I'll put it right here and then I'll, my, my tank will be full. I'll be filled with, to the brim with something that's going to satisfy me. But then some of you, you get it and you realize, man, it's not enough. It's not enough. I need more. I need more and there's really not much more that I can pour into this thing. You know, some of you, man, you, your thing is you just say, if I can get a girlfriend, if I can get a boyfriend, how many single people in the room? Okay, single people, look around. This is your, this is your pool right here, okay? <laughs> Listen, if I can just get a girlfriend, if I can just get a boyfriend, that's going to be the thing that makes me happy. That's going to be the thing that fills this thirst inside of me. Or maybe, maybe you said, and you, you try to like, okay, relationships, I'll try to do that. I'll try to add relationships into here, and maybe that'll be good. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you dove into a sexual relationship thinking it was going to be everything that you've ever wanted, only to realize that it did the, the, the lasting fulfillment wasn't there, that it actually left you a little bit more thirsty than when you started. Or maybe you realize, man, if I can just get married, okay, that's, that's going to be the thing. If I can just get married, I'll be, I'll be good. But then you realize, you know what? I don't think it's the married. I, I, I got married and I don't think it's the married thing anymore. Maybe it's kids. Oh my gosh, once I get kids, then I'm going to be happy. Come on. It's going to be awesome. But then you realize that kids like poop and pee all the time. And you're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. I, okay, that once they graduate and get out the house, man, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have more money. It's going to be incredible. And the problem is every time we do this, we try to fill up our lives we try, to, we try to fill up our lives with this, with, with this our soul's thir search for thirst. And we realize that we're actually drinking from the wrong well. You know, we go to these different places to satisfy the thirst of our soul. And we realize that despite our best efforts, you're not filled. You're not satisfied. In fact, you're, you're like even more thirsty than when you started this whole process. So what do you do? You realize that, you know, maybe it's not the well that's the problem. I think it's just what I pulled up from the well. You know, it wasn't, you know, it, it, it's, it, I, just, I just married the wrong person. It's the wrong person. You see, oh man, I, that, that's the problem. If I would have dated him, if I would have dated her, that would have been like, the, the, I would have I been happy if I would have dated him. I see, I mean, it wasn't Ricky, it was Ricardo. Ricardo gets me. <laughs> Ricardo gets me and who I am as a person. That's my problem. I should have went with him. Or like, man, you know what? I should have went to that school. That's the situation. I, if I would have gone to that school, then I would have been good. Or maybe, man, if I would have taken that job instead of this job, then I wouldn't have had so much stress and I made the wrong decision right over here. Or, you know, maybe it's like, man, if I just had a different friend group, I really think I'd be putting myself in a position if I had a, if I had a better friend group. And so you just keep updating your jobs. You keep updating your relationships, your friendships, your churches, 
and your obsessions. But if you're honest with yourself, you still hear this small, quiet longing of your soul for a drink that's actually going to last. And our situation stays the same. We keep drinking from the wrong well. You know, there's a story in John chapter 4 of a woman who's thirsty. Like, she's thirsty in every bit of the sense of the word, thirsty. And, uh, you know, Jesus was, was walking to Jerusalem, and so he decided that he's going to go through Samaria, this, this place around there. And it was around 12 noon, so it was like the heat of the day. So Jesus is tired. Man, his disciples are like, Jesus, you know, you go stay here. There's this well right around here. He's like, Jesus, stay here. We're going to go into the town. We're going to get some food, and we're going to come back, and it's going to be great. And so Jesus sits by this well. And uh, Jesus begins to engage in, in really something so scandalous, something, something so, like, man, if the, tab, the tabloids got a hold of this, if it would go all over social media, Jesus would be like, man, t- TMZ, what's going on? He would be like, you would get heavy criticism for this. And this is what happened. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4, verse 7. If you don't, we have it on the screens. And get ready for You guys ready for this? Ready for what Jesus did? It says this. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Oh my gosh, did you guys catch that? How how crazy is Jesus, man? That's awesome. What in the world? You guys aren't tracking me. Okay, let let me give you some, let me give you a kind of, let me tell you why this is so insane. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans, they did not like each other. In fact, you know, the reason this happened was because centuries before this, um, the Jews were conquered by by Babylon, and they were sent in exile in Babylon, and and part of the Jews stayed back, and so the Jews that were there, they kind of intermarried with with the Canaanites who were still around in this land, and, and, you know, they they kind of developed, you know, half half Jewish, half Canaanite, and they kind of developed this new tribe called called the Samaritans, and the Samaritans, man, they 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 were a mixed breed. The Jews hated them for that. And not only were they, were they, they did the Jews think they were inferior racially, the, Jew, the, the Samaritans, they would take half of the Jewish religion and half of the, of the Canaanite religion and they just kind of put it together to kind of have this, this mashup of, of this new religion. So not only did the Jews hate them because of who they were, they hated them because of what they believed. They thought they were heretics. They thought they couldn't, they couldn't give anything to anybody. They hated the Samaritans. So if you looked, if you're a Jewish person, and you, you would see these people as not really people. These people are just throwaway people. I don't need to talk to them. I don't need to associate with them. So it's a big deal when Jesus starts talking to her. But the outrage doesn't stop there. Man, it, it's scandalous at this time for a Jewish man to talk to any woman, let alone a Samaritan woman, in public. See, back then, women didn't have rights. They were thought as almost second-class citizens. Their, their testimony in court wasn't really valuable. You had to have a second person to come and testify. So Jesus, he, he looks at all these reasons, and he's, all the reasons that he shouldn't talk to this woman. And this woman, for her whole life, I'm sure, was, was greeted with just blank stares and people looking away every time she walked into her room. Do you get how radical this was for Jesus to talk to this woman? It, it was so radical. This woman didn't really know how to respond. She was shook. She, she says this in, in John chapter 4, verse 9. She says that the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She's like, you shouldn't be talking to me, and I don't want to be talking to you. Like, what's, what's going on here? And Jesus replied, he said, if you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you were speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. You know, Jesus kind of switches it up and starts talking in metaphors here. And this woman keeps going on, like, thinking that Jesus is talking in a literal form. Just like Nicodemus last week we learned about, you know. And she says this. She's like, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And then the wall is very deep. Where would you go to get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than the ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. And those who drink the water I will give them 
will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And at this moment, this woman starts to, to wonder, what's, what's going on here? Who am I talking to? And she says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Then Jesus said, go get your husband. It's kind of a weird pivot. Uh, weird flex, but okay. Um, he said, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with. She said, sir, you must be a prophet. Well, no, duh. Like, man, th this is so interesting. Because not only does Jesus, Jesus kind of begin this conversation with this woman, Jesus actually knows everything about this woman. <clears throat> he knows everything about her marital and sexual history. He knows that she actually not, had, did not have one husband, not two husbands, not three husbands, not four. She's had five husbands. And the man she's living with now is not her husband. You know, and it, it's crazy. Jesus still talks to her. You know, this woman, it's weird. She's getting water at noontime, which is like the hottest part of any day, especially if, if you live in a desert climate. Man, there, there's really no reason any person would go get water at noontime, except that really, that there are really two reasons that you would want to do this. You would, you would want to go at, at the dawn or dusk because that's like the coolest time of day, and you would want to really set yourself and your household up to have water the rest of the day to do all your chores, to do all your cooking, to, to, to do whatever you needed to do. Um, and then you would, you would avoid kind of this extreme heat that would happen. And this woman is going at the, at the most inconvenient time of the day. And the only reasons that she would do this is to avoid the other women that were going to be there. Because this woman, I'm sure this woman had been with other groups of women before. You know, not only was she marginalized, you know, she was like the marginalized of the marginalized of the marginalized. Like she would be in this groups of, of women and I'm sure these women would be like, homewrecker. Look at, look at that person over there. Oh, don't talk to her. Don't talk to her. You know, they lived in an honor, shame culture. And every time I'm sure this woman would try to connect with other people, they would just kind of shut her out. So this, this woman, we see now that the, she's, she's a moral outcast. She's had five husbands five divorces, and the, the person that she's living with now is not her husband. This girl's thirsty. She's part of the wrong people group, the wrong religion, the wrong gender, and the wrong side of morality. She's desperately trying to find something that will satisfy her soul. And the well that she keeps going to, the well of relationships, the well of guys, the well of attention, She's gone all in to see if a man can make her happy. You guys know of the, you know, the women who say, like, I don't need a man. I'm I-N-D-E-B-N-D. -E -E you know what that means? Like, this woman did not say that. I realize I spelled that wrong. <laughs> I've never been able to sing that song well. Maybe it proves I'm not an independent woman. But she thought maybe, okay, maybe if I go to this guy, that'll give me what I need. Maybe, okay, that guy was the problem. That, maybe go to the next guy. This is the guy. Ricardo's the guy, man. He's, he knows me. And he, maybe he, that didn't work out, so you go to the next person. Like maybe, maybe he'll actually meet my needs and make me feel safe. Maybe, maybe this next time I'll, I'll go over here and then I, I learn my lesson from these other people and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it the right way this time. I'm going to go with him. And again, it didn't really satisfy the way you thought and honestly, I bet if this woman at the well was honest with herself, her soul was even left feeling more thirsty than when she got into this whole business. So Jesus begins this conversation with this woman. He reaches across every single significant barrier that people can put up, a racial barrier, a cultural barrier, a gender barrier, a moral barrier. And she responds with, uh, you don't need to be talking with me. Like, do you know who I am? Like, you know who you are? Do you know who I am? You don't, you don't, you don't need to do this. You know, let me, let me remind you why you shouldn't be talking to me. Get away. Don't come close. I, I don't want this. You know, this, 
this, the response by this woman is common of people today. You know, I think because a lot of people today just assume that God is by default angry at them. You know, we have a hard time imagining a God who is holy and who is righteous and who is good and perfect, who is not already angry with us and already put out with us because of what we've done. We think that God is standing with a lightning bolt in the sky ready just to hurl it at us once we mess up. But notice how Jesus interacts with this woman. And notice how he displays the heart of our father, which is different than what I just described. He first off extends an invitation to a conversation with this woman. You know, he, he acknowledges her sin, but he doesn't rub her, rub her nose in it. He doesn't rub her nose in it at all. He actually, <clears throat> he actually offers a solution for the satisfaction that her soul has desperately been searching for. You know, Jesus is God come down to earth for us human beings. And his message is that he loves you. That he is not by default angry with you. He came to rescue and to save you. To bring you joy and gladness into our lives. But then when Jesus starts talking to her, she gets a little bit too real for her. So then she tries like, to sidestep what's going on. And she starts asking like, these deep theological questions. And, and Jesus kind of responds to it. But then she says this in, in verse 25. She says, listen, okay, I get it. Okay, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to me. And then Jesus does something he doesn't do very often in the Gospels. He says this, I am the Messiah. You know, I think this woman represents so much of what we do to try to satisfy our souls, meaning for purpose and, and satisfaction. You know, it's, it's a struggle that people have been dealing with since the beginning of time. And I believe if, if you're honest with ourselves, and I believe today, if we, if we really allow God, we could actually unlock this fulfillment that you've been searching for. I believe that you can unlock this, this thing that your soul has been crying out, that has been hungry and thirsty for. You can actually get there. And I believe if, we're, if, we, if we just have an honest conversation of where we're going, that God can, can point us in the direction of where he wants to be. So I'm going to close with three points today. The first point today is that we're all thirsty. You know, some of you in here, when he said, like, describe thirsty and be like, are you thirsty? You're like, not me. I'm, I'm, I'm not thirsty. Listen, you're thirsty. You're thirsty. Where everybody in here is thirsty. And listen, it's not a sin to be thirsty. It's not a sin to be thirsty. It's all about where you go to get your fix that determines whether or not your soul will be satisfied. You know, this woman had, has become an expert at getting what she wants from who she can get it from. You know, she was the, probably the woman who would wake up every single morning and, like, check Instagram first things. Be like, okay, how many likes did I get on this picture? Okay, who, who watched my Instagram story? Did he message me back? Like, what's going on? I need, to, I need to check this out. You know, and you might for a second. You know, that might fill you up for a second. But the problem when you go to the well, any other well besides the well of Jesus, Jesus says this. If you drink from that water, you're going to be thirsty again. Because if you put your validation in other people's hands, you will always have to go back for it. So where do you get your fix today? What is the well that you go to to kind of, to kind of quiet the, the thirst of your soul? Point number two, we always end up worshiping our well. We always end up worshiping our well. You know, there's a famous American uh, writer named David Foster Wallace. And man, David Foster Wallace was at the top of his profession Man, he was, he was an award-winning, best-selling, postmodern novelist. You know, he was not a Christian at all. He was not a believer. And a few years before the end of his life, uh, he, he gave what is now this famous speech at the commencement of Kenyon College. And this is what he told the graduates. Listen to this. Listen to this. He says, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much everything else will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, 
If they are what you tap into real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. You will never feel enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and the beauty of sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before your loved ones finally plant you. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over those around you to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They're default settings. I mean, this is an incredible bit of insight from someone who does not follow Christ, who doesn't follow anything. You know, he, he understood more than a lot of people that where we go for satisfaction, where we go for fulfillment, always ends up being what we worship. You know, it kind of sounds promising, but this story kind of has a sad ending to it. You know, a couple years after giving the speech, Wallace killed himself. And this non-religious man's parting words are pretty terrifying. Something will eat you alive. The wells that you go to for satisfaction will enslave you and will eat you alive. And we've all done it. We've all drunk from the well that we thought was going to be the thing to help us. And we've experienced the stinging of this lingering thirst. You know, the only way to get from where Get where we are and where we want to go is to go to the well of Jesus. My, my last point is that Jesus is the only well that can satisfy. You know, Jesus said, hey, if you worship me, I'll fill you up. All these other things, it's a drop in a bucket. But me, I can give you what you want. I can give you what your soul desperately needs. I can give you that good stuff. I can give you that water that, that flows from internally, this life-giving thing. And you'll be satisfied. You'll be okay. I'll give you stuff that lasts. You know, I think it's interesting when Jesus brings up her marital history and her sexual history. You know, some people might think, why did Jesus do that? Like, like there's already enough strikes against her. Why does, why, does he, why does he need to do this? It seems kind of like random that he's kind of pivoting and talking about this. Why does he chastise her, it seems like? But what Jesus was actually doing was pointing out this woman's well, what she had been going to. And he forced her to acknowledge that, hey, this thing that you've been a part of, it's not going to satisfy you. And Jesus says, hey, this is where you were, but I am here to fill you. You know, most of us know, you know, theoretically and in our heads that drinking from the wrong well won't really satisfy us. But there's actual power that comes from acknowledging the well that you are going to. There's actual power that comes from when you realize, I'm, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I know I probably can't get fulfillment out of it, but I'm going to it. You know, that's the first step in turning to Jesus. You say, okay, I recognize that this thing, this isn't going to do anything for me. God, I, I want this. I want the water that, that never ends. When you experience this, it doesn't just fill you up. It doesn't just give you purpose, but it does. It doesn't just give you eternal security, but it does. You know, this affects everything about you and affects the entire environment around you. You know, the story ends by this woman in verse 28. She said, this woman left her jar beside the well. I wonder if she meant to do that as an act of saying, you know what? I was going over here, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it. I'm going to Jesus. He says, the woman left the jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? 
So the people came streaming in from the village to see him. In verse 39, it says, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. And he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. You know, this woman who was an outcast in every sense of the word, who had no influence, had really had not a lot of friend groups. She was chosen to be the tool that God used to save an entire region. All because she allowed Jesus to, to fill her with this living water. If Jesus can do that with that kind of person, imagine what he could do in your life. How could he use you? I wonder what the transformation you would experience if Jesus actually, if you actually went to him to fulfillment and satisfaction and purpose and meaning. And I want to challenge you. Stop looking at other places for fulfillment. What if today you look to Jesus? What do you have to lose? You know, there's some in here who have tried everything. Do you know that God's default position, he's not mad at you. He wants to give you something. He wants to give you this free gift that we don't deserve. We can't earn it. And he says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm coming here and I want to extend an invitation to you. God wants to give you this free gift. You know that a short time after this experience with this woman, Jesus found himself on a cross. And this promise to her of, I'm going to provide you a well that will never run dry, was being paid up for as his arms were, were nailed to this wooden cross. And he took every single sin that we've ever committed, every single well that we went to that wasn't a good well, every single thing that we've done to, to dishonor God, he took it on himself because he loves you. He's not mad at you. And all he's asking you to do is saying, come, I'll, I'll come, Jesus. Let me drink from this well. And Jesus, he died, and when he died, all of your sin died. All the stuff that was holding you back died. And because Jesus rose on the third day, he offers you life. Life for eternity, purpose for now, and satisfaction for your thirsty souls.